Hey everyone, it's Tony. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 7, where we discuss House of Hammer, Episode 2. Sasha's away again today. We heard rumors she's either summoning Mount Kilimanjaro, or that she took two weeks of a four-week intensive crochet class and knitted herself into a mitten. Either way, we look forward to reuniting soon. Let's get into it. Dear listeners, just when you thought that it couldn't get any worse, it's about to get funnier. Sincerely, Tactless. This week we watched episode two of House of Hammer. Um, it was titled Sins of the Father. How appropriate was that? Yikes. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. On the upside, it wasn't as graphic as the last episode. Yeah, was, not not quite as yeah. dark, which is kind of refreshing. The first one, the first episode came at you hard. I mean, it was it was difficult to wade through some of that. But this one wasn't too bad. It was more historical stuff some more interviews less uh (laughs) less nasty text messages and all that crap from army so this one kind of just uh outlined what looks like a generational evil that just kind of ran through his family from multiple generations ago really it it goes yeah it goes back even further than we we thought right because they initially they did um the four generations well it turns out there's a fifth yeah <laughs> with yep. the great great grandfather from from russia who was not not a winner either yeah and who knows you know they stopped there but could it could go on forever who knows really with it spanning five generations and looking looking like it just gets progressively worse Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's kind of a scary thing to think of that you can pass down a legacy like that you know people think of passing down a positive legacy you know giving your children a business or having a name that that is well known but these people now they really have a legacy of of disgusting evil activity basically they do, yeah. It sounds like several generations of alcoholism, several generations of um, spousal abuse, and yeah, drugs, and yeah, all kinds of stuff. Which is it's scary to think about, you know, because and this kept coming to mind for me. I don't know if it did for you, but it's really only in modern times that people come out and and tell their story about this kind of stuff you know this going back to you know early 1900s and and stuff like no one talked about any of that stuff back then can you imagine being in a in an abusive relationship as a female in you know even the 50s how would that look you know what i mean that's you would have even less less help right Talk yeah. about feeling alone. And all that, know? that um, I mean, that attitude toward women where, how, how were you acting? What were you wearing? Did you, you know, did you make him slap you? Did you, you know, are yeah. you being a good enough wife? That's why he's drinking. That's why he's not coming home at night. You know, right. that kind of a thing. I mean, we saw, I think it was early 1900s where divorces were kind of all the rage for a little while, but it's still probably after World War II, you know the family values kind of thing resurged and i'm sure it was harder to leave somebody that wasn't good for you and all this stuff well not to mention that it was more difficult at that point for a woman to to be an independent single mother Mm -hmm. you know what i mean accurate they you know we're not used to the idea of career women they weren't used to the idea of a woman really supporting herself in a child or children mm-hmm. so just thinking about that as a woman at that time it must have been you must have felt completely lost like if you leave this guy where 
where do you go? What help is there for you? What job could you do? You, know, you can't leave your husband, especially a wealthy one, you know, and, and live a, a decent life with your kid. You know, that's gotta be an oppressive feeling on the other side of things because you don't okay. want to stay with this guy who's beating you or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then if you do leave, they had far fewer resources back yeah. then. Yeah. And you look at the social stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, you're your damaged woman. goods back yeah. then. Yeah. It was a huge deal. You know, now it's pretty common. You know, people understand that, you know, people get divorced or your single parent or, or whatever the case is. But back then, man, you were just like a, you were like a leper. <laughs> you know yeah. you didn't fit the the leave it to beaver type family model then there was something wrong with you you know mm -hmm. pretty crazy to think and it's it's interesting too because um army's armand hammer great-grandfather am i getting that right i hope he was married three times and yeah his second wife actually stated that he was controlling and something else like she really yeah, he, like th he threatened to beat her and stuff mm -hmm. like that too right yeah because they read a transcript from her where he threatened to beat her with a pipe or something mm -hmm. if i recall which is insane to me but it just speaks to it speaks to their family culture you know mm -hmm. all the way back as far as him they he saw his relationship with women as transactional it was what can i get from you if you're not going to provide something for me i don't need you around and i'm going to discard you you know yeah. just like they talked about his, his first wife was in russia mm -hmm. and that's where his first son came from and he trying to save face for himself actually got a paternity test on his first son hoping it wasn't his because of the stigma attached to being a Russian and having a Russian child and yeah, all that stuff back then, which is really jacked up. I can't even imagine what his son thought about that. You know, they, they, they mentioned a little bit about it, not a ton, but you know, when you feel like your parent doesn't really want you and they're kind of ashamed of you, that, that can't help. And I think that kind of fueled the fire for his son to become even worse than he was you know what I mean mm -hmm. you know he felt like I have to try to fit in but my dad's not gonna approve of me anyway because I'm kind of he was almost treated like an illegitimate kid you know he was yeah by all accounts pretty much everybody that mentioned it said that they did not get along yeah they were not <laughs> not a great yeah so and that was that was Julian and that is um army's grandfather and yeah. um casey his aunt it's her father and we do hear more from casey this episode yeah yeah she, she talks kind of tells that. a little bit about what happened there too because her mother ended up leaving julian with her but not her brother mm -hmm. right her brother yeah. stayed yeah which is kind of sad but that's that's how his his uh lifestyle and everything got passed down to army's dad and then to army mm -hmm. you know so they're they're basically this you know this uh episode was kind of connecting the dots on the downfall of the the hammer family and how it it did seem to just get progressively worse with each generation they were competitive people trying to one-up the person before them mm -hmm. you know it, it even talked about army's dad trying to upstage his own father because yeah. of the friction in their relationship just like julian's friction with armand mm -hmm. and you know it just seemed like it kept going right it did yeah it, each each generation had more privilege and more resources to do that yeah so pretty crazy and we also learned i i don't remember what point they got into this but the fifth generation julius who was from russia came to the united states and basically spied for the kgb 
getting yeah. <laughs> getting American secrets for the KGB. So that uh, that set them up for a great career as uh, as humans on this planet. <laughs> yeah, they he they said he was involved in starting the uh, the American Communist Party too, right? Mm-hmm. So winner right there too. Right, I know. You know and this is was... before all the McCarthyism and all that stuff. Yeah, scary guy. And then they they even mentioned that Armand was involved in that as well, right? Mm-hmm. He like he went to Russia at a young age and kind of picked up where his dad left off. Yeah, that's how he met Olga, his first wife. That's where his son Julian was born. Yeah, and he and it was kind of crazy because he came to the United States. He came back in the forties. I think he saw the writing on the wall that yeah, Russia's not going in a good direction <laughs> now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then he he kind of seemed, and they don't delve into this too much. I'd be curious to look into it, but they mentioned so much how how much power Armand had mm-hmm. as a successful businessman, meeting heads of state, meeting influential people in politics, not just in the U.S. but abroad as well. And it makes me wonder what type of influence he may have had on these people because they mentioned like he could get you know he could see you know they even had a um a phone call with uh john f kennedy Mm -hmm. to him like a little blurb from one they had a picture of him with uh with other heads of state and stuff and and i guess he could he could get in with them to you know go to events or talk to them or whatever the case is so i would i would kind of curious how deep that went right yeah because at one case one point i think it's casey right asked him why he's not president and he told him there's not enough power in that job or something like that Yeah. yeah yeah that was very telling but yeah we saw him we saw him it was crazy too with you know the the queen's passing we saw Charles, we saw Diana, we saw yeah. Andrew, we saw Fergie, and then um, <laughs> we saw him with the Pope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, like okay. The dude got around. He yeah. met all sorts of people that were high up on the totem pole, which, you know, obviously it, it could go either way. It could be one of those things that he just was in a position to meet these people and wanted to establish his own you know his own uh position by associating with them mm-hmm. but it kind of sounded like it went deeper than that like he had some sort of real influence on these people and their decision making which was yeah. just curious to me because you know if he's that forceful with his own family and in his own relationships you can imagine that in a business relationship or something like that mm-hmm. that he'd he would assert himself that's yeah. that's what he does it's what he who he is you know yeah i i agree well and you look at it too how much because he was a petroleum magnate yep with occidental petroleum how much did petroleum feed into the politics of the 1980s into the even the 1990s i mean even today so he probably had incredible amount of power i mean we had the the gas crisis in 79 yeah. i'm sure he was he was instrumental in in getting the country out of that maybe the world out of that you know yeah who so. knows I don't, I don't know what kind of role he played but yeah he was he must have been involved you know if mm-hmm. he knew all of these leaders and he was in the petroleum industry and that's successful you you know that he had meetings you know that he had had some kind of you know agenda that he tried to push with these people because he wanted to be successful and he was mm-hmm. so he must have made something happen for himself right but I, that's just one angle that i was just curious about watching it that they didn't really explore too much but you know it kind of makes you think that you know someone who is okay with the type of things that he did you know cheating on his wife objectifying women regularly hitting mm-hmm. women mm-hmm. doing all this stuff you know it's not it's not going to be outside of his wheelhouse to be doing all sorts of other shady stuff too you know it kind of just comes with the territory that's the truth and was he was he the idiot that had the the mistress 
Am I getting this right? Yes. With the he was Armand oh had a mistress. His gosh. wife found out about, but it, it was his third wife that found out about it, right? Yeah. The, the one that he one. was with. He yeah. Couldn't leave well, her. <laughs> yeah, I think that was part of it too. He it made it sound like he really married her for money, but yeah, she found out about his mistress, told him not to see her anymore. So she <laughs> he had her change her name and wear a wig and stuff. And pretend she was someone else so she could still stick around. <laughs> like, what a weird. <laughs> <laughs> and no word on whether his wife bought this or not. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, I, I just, <laughs> such, such an odd solution that wouldn't come into my mind. You know, I, if I yeah. was in that situation. <laughs> that, Apparently that's, that's, that's the that's... route he wanted to take, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean. <laughs> and and that she it, they made it sound like she interacted with his wife right mm -hmm. so his wife saw her yeah but she had to have interacted I don't know. With her at some point i don't know if she picked up on it or what i don't I mean who knows yeah we can't, I can't speculate to that but. can't fathom yeah maybe she's like this idiot <laughs> i'm old <laughs> there was, can't afford a divorce <laughs> it was almost comical when they said it though I was like, what yeah it wasn't even Sounds a good wig. Like I a, saw the picture. Oh yeah, it was not a good wig at all for wig. her. She doesn't. She's not a good blonde. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't it sound like a, like a stupid Cary Grant movie or something like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sounded. It sounded like a joke, but the dude just did it. Like yeah. I guess that's just who he was, right? Right. He was that big a winner. Can you? The imagine? scary thing about him was um and and they they had a couple different instances of talking about this that Armand would keep files on people that his family knew or people that he knew mm -hmm. record phone conversations yeah all sorts of stuff like he was up in everybody's business all the time watching them making sure they were I guess doing what he wanted them to do I know you can Which, take the man out of the KGB, but you can't take the KGB out of the man, <laughs> apparently, right? Right. Like that's that's some nefarious stuff too. And I, I'm assuming that you know, just judging by what what he did in, in various circumstances that he was trying to make sure that that everybody was doing what he wanted and not sullying his own name and his company in the in the process too. Mm -hmm. Because they do mention him hiring family members to work for the company and i'm sure he knew what they were up to he had must have been able to control everybody having dirt on all of them wouldn't you That's think the truth yeah to control them control the narrative surrounding them especially with his son julian as you mm -hmm. recall who's a, a loose cannon literally yeah yeah he was a nightmare that guy and that's See, that um army's grandfather casey's father who yeah. was raising michael on his own and kind of sound like a drug-fueled orgy with young ladies at his house most of the time i'm assuming yeah that's the way casey made it sound that he was just taking drugs smoking drinking he had underage girls there all the time and mm -hmm. he was just doing whatever he pleased which i don't know that's just, I, i'm sure that like we said before especially at that time it was very you know different time and you know, a lot more difficult to get get caught and get burned doing that stuff but they mm -hmm. also talked about um they talked about he's he's the one that shot one of his friends is that right yeah in quote-unquote self-defense yeah yeah and armand basically sounded like paid paid somebody off to get him out of it he's mm -hmm. in an argument that his friend owed him money and he shot him and killed him yeah so that i don't know that just <sighs> leads me to say <laughs> armand knew what everybody was doing he knew these people had this stuff and i think part of him bailing them out regularly was because you have complete control over somebody when you save them from a murder sentence or something like that right i mean you That's could always bring that point. up hold it over their head yeah and i'm sure he did they didn't talk about that too much but 
you got to believe that if he has that kind of ammo on his own son, that he would use it to his advantage, right? Mm-hmm. He didn't yeah, seem to really yeah. truly care about anybody except himself, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I'm sure that he used that to his own advantage to get them to do what he wanted them to do. I, I think you're right. Cause he did, um, Casey seemed to think that he put Julian to work monitoring people on our yeah. half behalf. So yeah, that, that could have been yeah, a blackmail situation for all we know, really. Really could have been. And then, Gosh, when it gets to uh, to Army's dad, Michael, he was kind of a mess at first, too. Mm-hmm. Well, he learned from his dad all the partying and drugs and all that stuff. But then they talk about, um, I guess at some point, he realizes that if he gets the blessing of his grandfather, Armand, he could basically surpass his own father in notoriety and wealth and all that stuff so they become pretty close Mm -hmm. michael and armand and michael gets a job at at the petroleum company um sounds like he's kind of a higher up dude um yeah it did sound like it came with some prestige and almost the way it was framed it almost sounded like julian was kind of resigned like yeah this is what's happening my son is now you know higher in my father's affections yeah yeah which i'm sure just fueled the fire for michael too because he was you know doing all the same stuff and now he has a prominent job which any amount of power for somebody like this is just like pouring gasoline on a fire Mm -hmm. not to mention i'm you know, if he's higher up, I'm sure he was pulling a real good salary. So he had the money to buy whatever he felt like doing. You know what I mean? And it's just like, the more you look at every component of every family member, generation to generation, it's like a perfect storm to create something that's really disgusting and horrible, which ended up being what happened with army i mean i'm not saying that he didn't make a choice i'm not saying that he didn't do all this stuff on his own because he's definitely responsible for what he did Mm -hmm. but man it's just it's it's crazy to see it from a multi-generational level just this happened and then this happened and then you know constantly fueling their their downfall you know yeah it was almost it was almost orchestrated you know it was bred into them wasn't it this this depravity like they you know they had nobody to check them starting with great-grandpa julius who was you know a spy (laughs) (laughs) for the worst country on earth at that time you know and i think it's casey that mentioned that as well right that that the the problem was no accountability. Mm-hmm. You know, they recognized that with this prominence, with this amount of money that they had, they could essentially buy whatever they wanted, whether that is possessions or people or freedom for themselves or just lack of consequence, you know, by paying somebody off so they don't get busted for whatever they're doing. Yeah that affluenza (laughs) yeah they mean they basically learned the way everybody learns it's a cause and effect i keep doing this and nothing happens i'm just gonna keep pushing the envelope yeah why not? you know there was no there was no poor consequence for these guys they were just living it up and doing whatever the heck they wanted to and no one said or did anything to stop them yeah you know it's it's interesting going back to the great grandfather Julius too. The CIA had a file on him where they mm-hmm. followed him around and they knew what he was doing, but they didn't really intervene either. I wonder what happened there. <laughs> you know, well, and it, at one thing. at one point they mentioned the FBI looking into the entire family, mm-hmm. and J. Edgar Hoover himself writing on a memo or something that the hammers were not good people or something like that you remember that too yeah 
Like it's not like they were under the radar necessarily, but I, I don't know. Maybe maybe they didn't have enough hard evidence to nail them for something, or they don't really talk too much about that. But you it's know, I'd be bizarre. curious. You know, if you have the head of the FBI knowing your knowing your name, that sounds <laughs> like a, a bad list. I wouldn't want to be on. Right. right, and and at the very least, you could have gotten them all on drug charges. I'm sure. Probably. Because Michael meets Army's mom when he's like 27, 28, Drew, on a mm-hmm. flight. And of course, he's drunk at the time, but she she makes sure to tell, Casey makes sure to tell us that. <laughs> That's an underlying theme in a lot of this. And she, I guess Drew is religious, not his usual type, and they're kind of hoping, hey, Drew's going to fix him. <laughs> Which always works out, right? Oh, for sure. <laughs> how, how many of our female listeners have ever dated a guy hoping to change him yeah it works totally. every time doesn't absolutely. it? absolutely that that bad apple and the bunch always <laughs> opposite right <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and then i guess and so army army's like born in 85 86 something like that and then um armand dies in 1990 at the age of 92 casey said it was like kind of all over the news that he had passed away they you know were talking about his you know uh yeah, they made him out to be this humanitarian. Yeah, great guy. <laughs> terrific person. And his uh, his bequeathment is to leave Casey two hundred fifty thousand dollars. His son Julian five hundred thousand dollars. Michael gets a Rolls Royce and executor of the will, <laughs> which that uh, that starts up some new interesting conflicts, doesn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah. I think the um, just the whole family just seems to be so focused on themselves as individuals mm-hmm. you know they're always fighting each other and like that i don't hear of any one-on-one relationship in their family father to son or daughter or wife and husband where they're really getting along it's just rife with conflict and friction and mm-hmm. backstabbing and it's horrible and then you throw yeah. an inheritance into the mix and these people it's not gonna help <laughs> you no, know what i mean oh it's nightmare have you seen that film uh knives out no oh my gosh so this the family in that is like this too there's yeah. even a murder and they're all like oh you did it you did you know like all this oh, stuff and you find all this backstory about everybody they're all awful people and <laughs> they all stand to inherit and you know like all this stuff <laughs> And you're like, oh, great. <laughs> so many stories of that, though, not even just here, but just people fighting over inheritance. Look what happened to when Prince passed away. Oh, yeah. Because he, because he didn't have a will. Yeah. And everybody just tried to stick their hand in that jar at the same time. And it's like, it's just a, a disgusting way to deal with someone who's past things Mm -hmm. you know like it almost it's almost like spitting on their grave to me just kind of how I look at it it is I know know. and to be that I don't I don't know the word for it like grabbing you know like literally the only good thing about is going to happen is you're going to die and I get your stuff you know yeah that like just waiting for someone to to kick off Anyway, I took us uh, on a little sidetrack there for a Yeah, thing. and you know what? I missed out on, um, I had to pay close attention to the Finsta section <laughs> of this. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of surprising. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I did not know that term. I just kind of assumed at some point that anyone who was prominent probably had a public profile and then like a covert profile for like just their buddies or whatever, mm-hmm. just because, you know, it, there's a lot associated with, you know, your public persona that you might not want to post certain things or whatever. Yeah. But fair. armies is, uh, is quite different in so many ways. <laughs> what you thought about, <laughs> about well, I mean... his, his Finsta. <laughs> I mean, his screen name was uh, El Destructo. I mean, that uh, 
that in itself sounds sounds great um but yeah he's he's a freaking weirdo number one and uh number two even if you know after seeing the first episode if you harbored any you know you're like oh yeah maybe he's really not that bad a guy or no he's that bad a guy you know he's doing drugs he's doing drugs while driving he's taking a video of himself uh doing a drug pee test because i guess that's what you do when you're a drug user he was proud of himself that he passed it even though he was taking drugs i just i yeah it just any of this junk is uh, in addition to the concept of having a finsta (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's just beyond my my comprehension and not anything that you know the people that i associate with do so this is all a new a new uh, genre <laughs> yeah i think the thing the thing that really got me when well when they first mentioned his finsta and that he was posting stuff i just thought oh well you know he's probably like posting little blurbs and stuff i didn't think that he would post videos of himself and his own face doing drugs, drinking and driving, doing all this crap, you literally just incriminate yourself. Right? Like, how stupid can you be that you take a video to document your illegal activity? Right. And that even goes back, you know, even Casey said that she found photographs that her dad took before Insta, the Polaroids guys, look it up um he had polaroids of like all the nasty stuff he was doing you know the drugs he was doing all the stuff like what possesses these people to document (laughs) um document their their misdeeds right i mean wouldn't you think that somebody gets a hold of that and hey there's all the evidence they need to prosecute you right and you gave it to them yeah just here yeah here's my incrimination on a silver platter well right like you said earlier i mean they've gone so long without any you know any repercussions for this behavior they're like what ebbs i can just look at back on these drug addled videos (laughs) with fondness now you know no all right and what do you gain from that too like are your friend i guess maybe his friends do this too or you know, he's getting a bunch of likes, you know, oh yeah, I like to see yeah. in that cup. That was great. You know, like what the what? <laughs> I wouldn't enjoy seeing anyone pee on anything. Let alone I, yeah. on a cup. No. Yeah, none of none of it seemed <laughs> like really reasonable. It was just like kids in a bad like after school special kind of a thing. You know, and then at the end the principal talks to them, they go to a drug rehab program and they're better, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> but he's in his 30s so there you go it's almost sad in a way because of that too right like it seems so juvenile Mm -hmm. and this is supposed to be a grown man that you know i mean it's not like he doesn't have other things to occupy his time like he's not let's be honest he's not a terrific actor he's an actor he's a good looking guy yeah you know so i guess it just baffles me like why he chooses to do this and document it and uh, i don't know i is it like an ego trip thing you think maybe i mean and i kind of want to know yeah listeners if you know people that act like this is this like normal for the, i don't know i'm an old i feel like i'm an old person and we're around the same age range <laughs> <So>. <laughs> i'm like the kids these days you know i mean is this a rich, yeah, like, rich person thing you know i i don't really i don't comprehend maybe you guys can shed some light on it for me <laughs> also posting pictures of mannequins with bondage pictures you know i mean like yeah who does that stuff mental people you got me for me just seems nuts he, he does he's he seems that picture they keep showing of his legitimate instagram the real one with him and the crazy glasses and the crazy hair looking kind of like doc brown you know yeah that it's like that just got electrocuted a, yeah <laughs> <laughs> that may be more telling than he he thinks <laughs> it could be yeah i mean his life sure does seem to be a quite a mess you know 
Yeah. It could very well be disaster. Well, they um at toward the end now um of the episode, they leave us with two cliffhangers, essentially. Our friend Courtney from the first episode comes back and she talks about that meeting in 2020 where she talks she finally meets Drew. Mm-hmm. His mom at dinner. And I, I think the parents are divorced. Yeah, the parents I think divorced in 2012. So um she's meeting them and and i think doesn't he tell her like forewarns her or something like that about his mom (laughs) yeah he says something right (laughs) like it's gonna be weird or something like that and um courtney says that army's like kind of bad mouth and his dad at this point at the at the meal and then his mom goes well you know he you know you need to be easy go easy on your dad because he's been through some such and such family trauma and then she doesn't finish the sentence so we d- we don't know what that is yet and then the very last scene with casey poor thing that this was this was pretty heartbreaking the producer asked her casey did your father sexually abuse you and we cut to black yeah. so there's there's probably something there right because we know there's gotta be yeah I mean... julian was a pos well and like like we've been saying too you don't have consequence for your for your actions Mm -hmm. you keep pushing the envelope and at some point you're so deep into it and you've crossed so many lines with the drugs and drinking and the sex and the beating people and cheating and like nothing is off limits at that point i would Mm -hmm. assume i mean the dude is just whatever whim comes to mind at the time is fine with him right yeah because what's going to happen to him nothing's happened so far he's invincible yeah yeah and i think that's you know hearkening back to to the first episode army mentions at one point um when he's messaging one of the i don't remember which woman it is i apologize but he mentions basically during an act of i think it was a part where he was basically raping the woman he talks about how he felt like a god oh because he was in complete control. Mm-hmm. He was doing whatever he wanted to, and nothing was happening to him. Yeah, and I feel like that's that's the feeling that these guys are going for, mm-hmm. and they have to keep. You know, it's like it's like taking drugs. If you want to get the same high, you have to take more, mm-hmm. right? They have to push the envelope more and more so they get that feeling like I'm invincible. I can literally do the most disgusting heinous things and nothing happens yeah right you know? right yeah and you need more you need something more depraved to get that fixed like you said that yeah that's like, a good point on a psychological level you know i'm obviously i'm not a psychologist i don't you know have any formal training but you know you have to think lo- if you're thinking logically through the steps of this mm-hmm. that that seems to be what they're chasing right yeah is that feeling and at that point they're so addicted to feeling that power over everybody that no one is off limits to manipulate or take advantage of or anything really i mean Mm -hmm. you know the to be able to you know shoot your friend because he says you owe him money or beat your wife because she disagrees with you or whatever these guys did you know there's there's just something so fundamentally wrong in their psyche that allows them to do these things and keep on going right yeah accurate and it it's interesting their their um residual carnage is always humans right 
you don't see them out there like shooting a white tiger or something like that it's always no. it's always manipulation it's always stuff that can be kept kind of behind closed doors you know that's yeah. really crazy and you don't see them necessarily being so self-destructive mm-hmm. which i think is interesting because some people you know they'll especially you know you're famous actors musicians that almost become really self-destructive in taking drugs and doing things that hurt themselves and all that stuff. And these guys would drink and take drugs, but it sounded like the destructive behavior was always directed at everyone else. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and maybe yeah. the drugs and the drinking were just to kind of numb their conscience for the time being or whatever that is. But, you know, I, I found that kind of interesting too. Like it was, it wasn't necessarily like, oh, I can't handle this stuff. It was it was almost like a calculated malicious thing because mm-hmm. it was always directed at someone. Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And that that's what made me I keep going back to Julius, the KGB guy, because that's what the KGB teaches you to do. Yeah. Is basically, you know, manipulate, use people, steal, lie, steal, cheat, whatever at any cost. Yeah. Because they teach you the end justifies the means. If you get what you want, that's just collateral damage. Who cares, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, you know, taking that that way of thinking to its end result is this. Yeah. This is how it ends. You know, which just proves such a dangerous way to look at interacting with people. Such a dangerous way to yeah. think on a daily basis. Because look how many, I mean, who knows at this point, because they don't name names for, you know, Julian or Michael or Mm -hmm. or Armand, but how many lives do you think these dudes destroyed over years and years, right? Yeah. And yeah, to think because they wielded so much power. I mean, they had, yeah, the stars of (laughs) Hollywood. I saw Ted Turner, who was extremely powerful you know the yeah the president many years many uh different iterations of presidents and yep. yeah i can't yeah what deals did he make with people or whatever i was almost expecting to see jeffrey epstein honestly in one of these videos you know right yeah with all the stuff they talked about him it sounded like they're uh people that would get along don't you mm-hmm. think <laughs> i know scary to say be creepy i I am grateful that they kind of gave us a little bit of a breather after the last one because it it really was kind of refreshing to just have like a almost like a here's a like factual history of his family Mm -hmm. and they threw some stuff in there but it wasn't half as dark and and graphic as the first episode so it was kind of nice to not feel so gross after you watched it yeah we'll see what episode three holds for us we'll have to uh go down that road and then we'll get another synopsis for those of you who (laughs) decide not to watch this which i don't blame you at all yeah not. i'm hoping that our uh yeah that our commentaries will be sufficient for you to not only know what's going on but what what to take away from it which Mm -hmm. i think is is the most important part you know there's always something that you can learn and something you can glean from the best and the worst of people, in my opinion. You know, whether it's this is what I should do or this is what you don't even want to get close to. Mm-hmm. And this is obviously the latter. But you know, I'm hoping that anybody that's in any kind of relationship like that or sees somebody that acts like that, turn around and run them run as fast as you can away from yeah, these people. Yeah, no joke. Or anybody with a finsta in their 30s. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> don't even (laughs) weird they can't show their mom what they're up to no (laughs) they're up to no good and you don't want any part of that no no (laughs) and thanks for sticking with us and i hope you'll subscribe on your favorite podcast hub because we're pretty much all of them and if if you like what we're doing please leave us a a five-star review on either apple podcast or spotify because it really helps us out (laughs) we appreciate it (laughs) it's huge yeah and you know if you have ideas questions you want answered 
um, you want to reach out to us, feel free, you know, send us a, send us a message. You can even leave us voicemails. We have a voicemail number. You know, we'd love to hear from our listeners too. We're all in this together. So <laughs> you have a story of your own that you want to share, feel free. Mm-hmm. You know, we read them all. We do. We do. You can send us a voicemail on acre.fm slash sincerely tactless. Tweet at us at sincere tactless. Find us on TikTok at sincerely tactless or email us at sincerely tactless pod at gmail.com. Thanks for riding with us on this crazy train and not losing your marbles. Until next time, may your Instagram be clean enough to share with your mother.